contrary to a lot of the more hysterical people out there, Donald Trump isn't Hitler, right? I mean, Hitler could have repealed Obamacare. The Iran deal and China-Taiwan relations. Hi, I'm Ian Bremmer. This is your G-Zero World. It's a beautiful day in Midtown Manhattan. I've got a big interview with you in just a little bit. Jonah Goldberg, who is the author of the new New York Times best-selling book, Suicide of the West, great time to talk about that. Puppet Regime brings you Mark Zuckerberg, and then, of course, your office hours. But first, your world this week. President Trump has withdrawn from the Iran deal, the most significant foreign policy decision of his presidency to date. He has shown that he is a unilateralist, not an isolationist. He's more than happy not to listen to allies when it suits his purposes. We saw that in the withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We saw it when the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord. But no question, this decision on Iran is the most substantial. America's key allies in Europe, the French president, the German chancellor, the British foreign minister, all weigh in strongly in the past few days, saying that their top priority is keeping the Americans in the deal. Trump listened, and Trump decided he was going ahead anyway. But the bigger question is, can you trust the United States? I mean, ultimately, American leadership is a relay race from one president to the other. You pass the baton, you want to win the race. President Trump has shown very clearly that his interest is in ripping up things that Obama did because he was a loser president. Trump does the best deals. But if you're an American ally, you really don't feel like you can engage with the United States with that kind of continual stop-start presidency. The one piece of good news is I don't think it matters at all for North Korea. They weren't really going to denuclearize anyway. It's not like they trust the Americans, the Americans trust the North Koreans. We are going to have a meeting coming up between uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un, and both sides really want some kind of deal. In fact, Trump may want one even more now that he got rid of the Iranian deal. Watch that space in a positive way, but on the Iran front, all the news is going to be negative. And to China, Taiwan, where last week the Chinese government warned 36 foreign airline companies that they could not refer to Taiwan as a separate country or else. The White House responded and said that was Orwellian nonsense. It would not be tolerated. To be clear, the companies themselves will tolerate it. They do not want to get into trouble with the Chinese government. There's a lot of self-censorship going on. The airliners, with hotel companies, with automotive companies, you name it. China's getting a lot bigger. They don't have rule of law. You don't have judicial recourse. But this is a red line for the Chinese government. They consider Taiwan a domestic policy issue, not foreign affairs. So while there are many things the Americans can and do hit the Chinese on, intellectual property issues, the deficit, heck, I mean, even human rights, um, those are places where the Chinese government is prepared to actually sit down and talk and sometimes even compromise with foreign governments, with the Americans. On Taiwan, not the case. If the Americans decide they're going to continue to pursue this issue, they're going to see that the Chinese relationship is going to get a hell of a lot sharper and real fast. In reality, I think it was a throwaway line, and I think the Americans will back off. U.S.-China relations have plenty else to spar about, and spar they will. That's enough from me. Now let's turn to you for a special Iran deal edition of Office Hours. We've heard a lot about Europeans' reaction to um, pulling out of the JCPOA. I would like to know what the consequences, uh, is it a win or a lose for Russia and China? For Russia, it's a win because the Russians just love anything that weakens American influence and also drives a wedge between the Americans and the Europeans. Nothing does this bigger than getting out of the Iran deal. Also, the Russians, a major oil producer and exporter, oil prices going up, they're happy. For the Chinese, a little harder to say. They're going to have a little more influence in the region. More countries are going to see that they like the Chinese as opposed to the Americans, so the petro RMB becomes more important in terms of denominating oil. But they're unhappy with the instability, they're unhappy with potential war, and they're unhappy as a major oil consumer with the prices going up. Presuming that our allies don't join us in dropping out of the deal, what concessions can we expect to exert from the Iranians by reimposing sanctions? The Iranians are going to be concerned about U.S. military scenarios. I mean, unlike North Korea, where if we hit them, you could potentially blow up the peninsula. The Iranians don't have nukes. The Israelis do. They're really outgunned by the Americans and American allies in the region. I think that they would be really reluctant to start up an obvious nuclear weapons program with us flexing our muscles the way we are right now, the Israelis, the Emiratis, and the Saudis. But 
Short of that, there's really not much we can do to convince a harder line Iranian government and getting harder by the day that they want to engage with the Americans. They already signed a deal that they were implementing to the letter. Trump says that they weren't implementing the spirit of the deal, but his own Secretary of Defense says actually they were implementing the spirit of the deal. And every other country out there that was involved in the JCPOA, remember, we're talking the Brits, the French, the Germans, the Russians, and the Chinese, they're all saying Iran's in good stead here. So it's really hard for the Americans by themselves to get anything more out of the Iranians at this point. I think this was much more about Trump showing he was going to rip up that bad Obama deal. What do you think should be included in the new deal acceptable to Trump other than nuclear and ballistic missiles, anything else? Usually Trump just wants to be able to put his name on something that's a tiny bit better. That's what we saw with the South Korea trade deal, the Brazil trade deal, probably what we see with NAFTA. In this case, I'd say that's not true, partially because the demands that Trump has made himself very clearly are pretty strong. They're about ballistic missile development and miniaturization um, of uh, nuclear warheads to put on top of them so you can't have nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. They're about Iran supporting terrorist organizations, engaging in proxy warfare against American allies in the region. But the big issue is that unlike the trade deals where everyone around Trump really wanted to kind of get Trump to a deal, just give him something, give him something, here the people around Trump mostly really want to rip up the deal and they're just not happy with it. That's clearly the case with John Bolton the national security advisor. That's clearly the case with new Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. So I think the distance from here to there to get to something that Trump would find acceptable is way not bridgeable. And that is part of the reason why I'm so pessimistic about this move. Folks, this week we're tuning in live for a new product launch at Facebook. Here at Facebook, we care a lot about community. We want to help you stay informed about your communities to be engaged in their lives, and to build more inclusive communities for your communities. 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 Your last book, right, was very partisan received, right? Yeah, well, this book yeah. feels like it's not that. That's right. And I That's like right. that. Yeah. And I'm here with Jonah Goldberg, uh, whose book, Suicide of the West is a New York Times bestseller. Just came out. Delighted to hear it. He's a senior editor at the National Review, also with the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. But we are right now here in New York City. I'm delighted to have him as my guest. Jonah. It's great to be here. Good. Good to be with you. Yeah. Your energy is infectious. No, that's good. We need that. Well, you know, video will do that. Too. Yeah, that's There's right. No that's question. true. That's true. So why don't we let's jump right in okay. with this question of tribes, uh -huh. right? So you said aliens looking down come through every 10,000 years, uh -huh. they would normally see all of us as tribes mm -hmm. until this last visit. Right, so if you had an alien who was visiting planet Earth once every 10,000 years, since we split off from the Neanderthals about 250, 300,000 years ago, um, for every visit he made until, let's say he did it for over 250,000 years, for the first 24 visits, all he would see is semi-hairless apes foraging and fighting for food. We evolved in an environment where, uh, where living within the tribe or the band or the troop, whatever you want to call it, small group was everything. All of our politics were personal and defined by the group. The world was divided between us and all of them. And uh, that, is, that was our evolutionary adaptation that allowed us to become apex predators, was our ability to cooperate with each other. Fast forward to today, the point about tribes is that we still have the same wiring we had 10,000 or 100,000 years ago. We still naturally want to divide the world up, our worlds up, into us versus them. What is required, what makes our civilization special is that the West, liberal democratic capitalism, the American founding had within it this argument that you shouldn't see the world that way, that it wasn't zero sum. Um, and that is something writ large that we're kind of losing sight of again, is that we were, we're trying to retreat back into our tribal self. How much of this gets fixed if women run things? <laughs> um, I think you could make a pretty good case that it would help. Um, it would, uh, women are better at building consensus. There's a lot of social science evidence to support all of that. Whenever you get a real dislocation of men right. to women, um, society becomes a lot more violent, first of all. Well, the Wild West was like that. And because of the gender selection abortions that we see in India and China, I, I think the, this, the, uh, the ability to keep young men from rising up and embracing a more 
aggressive form of nationalism will be a real challenge, among other things. Do you think that um, in America, young men today are increasingly embracing a more violent form of nationalism? Um, what I do think is, take violence out of it, that there are a lot of people on the right who are embracing essentially a right-wing version of identity politics for white people, which I think is a really dangerous and bad thing. Um, and I think it's in response to the rise of identity politics in general in college campuses, which comes from the left. That doesn't excuse it, but it helps you understand where it comes from. And that they want to create and cultivate this, not ethnic, right? It's not Irish pride or Italian pride, but based around this abstract category of whiteness, this white cultural affinity that um, you know creeps into some weird Aryan stuff. And I think it is a product of these guys who are deracinated, who are looking for meaning in their lives, and they can't find it from the traditional outlets of civil society. They can't find it in the economy. It's not working for religion very well. And, and religion is sort of uh, receding from a lot of these people's lives. So it's, what do they hold on to? Identity politics. Right. This is this, So if you want to take that away from them, what should they grab on to instead? So part of me being a conservative, particularly a small c conservative, is that I don't want to nationalize politics at all except for the truly essential things. Um, you know, there's a reason why during a war everyone drops what they're doing and rally around the cause. Um, the government can't love you. It can only do a few things remotely well and it should stick to those things and we should push as much power to the most local level possible to give, a pe give people a sense that they have more control over their lives. So I'm wondering what it was over the course of the past 10 years, right, yeah. in the United States that you think really hastened this devolution into a much more pernicious, much less civic engagement yeah. for the average American citizen. I, I can think of a bunch of things. I mean, partly is just the last 10 years is when Facebook went like this, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that's part I of it. I thought tech would be a piece of it. There are a lot of things that radicalize a lot of people on the right. One was this failure to deal with immigration, promising, you know, that, you know, from Ronald Reagan's amnesty saying this is the last one and never following through on it. I think that uh, this obsession with ideological purity that for some reason overtook a big chunk of the Republican Party. I mean, I used to joke that the Republican primaries um, were like C-SPAN reenactments of the end of Spartacus, where each candidate was like, <laughs> I, am, I am Ronald Reagan. No, I am Ronald Reagan, right? And part of the problem with that is that when you get obsessed with principles, principles I agree with, by the way, but when you say that's all you believe in, um, you, uh, you lose sight of what politics is supposed to be about, which is persuasion, right? It's not who's the purest, it's- Which ideas? It's, which, it's how do we bring ready. people in? And instead, these guys increasingly just kept doubling down on their purity rather than doing what Reagan did, which is tell stories that brought people in. And instead, you had these focus grouped sort of think tanky primaries that picked hot button issues and replayed the 1982 Reagan playbook over and over and over again. And one of the beneficial things about Donald Trump is he smashed all of that. Um, it's not, he's not the form of the destroyer I would have picked. Or, I mean, he comes right after the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, but. Good visual there, by the way. Thank you, thank Of you. Trump and the Stay Puft <laughs> Man. Uh, to either one, you know, it's sort of. Uh, um, and then there's the, uh, and also there's, you know, there's all this, again, this stuff that's way upstream of the actual politics, the big sort. People are tending to, in their lives. Self. Self-segregate amongst people who agree with them. Um, I think the, the, you know, Charles Murray writes about this a lot in Coming Apart, that it used to be that the corporate leadership of, the fa of a factory town lived in the town. And now- They still I, helicopter in. Yeah, right, for the, for, yeah. for the photo op. Yeah. Right, and then they leave, right? And, and so I, I'm not sure you could pick a single one thing. I think it is a confluence of events. Suicide of the West is a pretty bleak concept. Uh, if, if we're really on that path, uh -huh. What's the thing that's gonna happen in the next few years that's gonna make you say, oh my God, we just, we, we are, we're at the precipice? Yeah, so um, I understand why, certainly it is a bleak sounding title, right? But I didn't call it the death of the West. No. I didn't call it the decline of the West. Part of my argument in the book is that um, there is no teleology, there is no right side of history, there is no, there's no God who is going to guarantee anything and I'm not saying this as an atheist, I'm just saying that we, sort of like the argument about free will versus determinism. Who gives a rat's ass? You still gotta get out of bed in the morning, which basically means you 
you have to assume that free will is a thing, right? And suicide's a choice. And so while I understand the title is bleak, the book actually ends with this call for, you know, instilling a sense of gratitude in what we've got. Okay, but let me now ask my question again, okay. which is, so, Suicide of the West is a kind of bleak title. <laughs> now, um, what is the thing that over the course of the next five years, if you saw it, you'd go, wow, I was not successful in stopping the Americans from heading down this path. This is really a tipping point. They may not wake up. What is it? That's a good question. To say suicide of the West implies we're really thinking about like, you know, turning the keys on and staying in the garage. Yeah. Uh, what is it? The only reason the Constitution has binding power is because we give it binding power. If one day we just to say, yeah, forget it, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden we are basically in a world where we just fight over which strong man or strong group gets to run everything. And uh, it wouldn't take much beyond a, a depression style economic, you know, they came out of quite a bit during the Great Depression. There's a reason why FDR was president for life. Um, I think if we had a similar kind of Great Depression, which I don't think is inconceivable, uh, I'm not sure the Constitution survives that. So right now, I mean, it's less the suicide of the West, more like, I, hi, I'm the United States and I have a problem. Yeah, but suicide, you know, the suicidal tendencies, I mean, I could have called it suicidal tendencies of the West. There you go. Um, but <laughs> uh, I think the suicidal tendencies are getting stronger. And one of the things that, um, you know, you're supposed to do when you see suicidal tendencies is treat them as the warning sign that they are. Your book's about suicide of the West. If you wanted to get beyond the United States and say, this is a Western problem, mm -hmm. who else would you point me to and say, hey, Ian, these guys are right there with us? Uh, you know, remember there was a whole thing from Osama bin Laden about people respect the strong horse? Um, there is, a, to an extent, the problem that if America falls down, there are a lot of countries that are going to start switching to look to other strong horses. And you can see that already in places like Hungary, where Viktor Orban talks about how capitalism has got, maybe outlived its utility and you need this sort of authoritarian style market management kind of thing. I think the world is the world that I want to live in is going to have a really hard time if if America stumbles because there's nobody poised to fill that role. So are you and I a tribe, Jonah? I'm sorry. Are you and I a tribe? Us? Yeah, yeah. Versus them. Uh, uh, no, the unwashed. I mean, I mean, you know, public intellectuals. We dress kind of the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, I mean we're, you're bigger and hairier, but leave that aside. We're. Uh, I, I'm huge in my field. I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. We're a weird looking tribe. I mean, that's pretty um, clear. Glasses wearing. I mean, you know. Um, I think. No, not yet. I mean, I, I do think there is a tribe of elites of globalists or whatever you want to call them that do have a shared sense of their self interest, if not if that is not necessarily always expressed. One of the points I always try to make is that, um, to policy ma policymakers, is that complexity is a subsidy, right? And there are a lot of people in the elites who really who like from complexity. Sure. Yeah. And, Keep um, people out. Right, it's a moat, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And, um, uh, and so I think we probably live in that world, but I think we also have a certain amount of sympathy to removing a lot of that moat, right? And that you actually want an innovative, meritocratic in the Jeffersonian sense, where there are paths to the American dream, there are paths to pursuing your own happiness. Um, it's the best kind of tribe. It's it is a the best tribe, kind of tribe that cares. That's right, that's yeah. right. Well, I, I originally, for, for about two years, the working title of this book was The Tribe of Liberty. Because ah, I, I wanted people to go. form a tribal attachment to liberty. I'm glad you didn't use that title. <laughs> that, that's not a title that sells. So. That, that's one of the reasons why I changed it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Jonah Goldberg. New York Times best-selling author, Suicidal Tendencies of the West. <laughs> you should buy this book. That's the right message. Good to see you, Jonah. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very much, my friend. Great. Thank, okay. Thanks for having me. That's your show this week. Uh, if you want to listen to the entirety of the big interview, the uncut version, you can check out our podcast, G-Zero World, available at podcast stores near you. That's right. And next week, come back. We've got Israeli former Prime Minister Ehud Barak. It's going to be a really great show. I will see you then.